So you thought React Query and SWR were just about fetching data? Turns out I've got five different ideas for you about how to reuse SWR or React Query in new and novel ways. Let's get right into it. One of the things that I love doing on this channel is getting you to think differently about the things that we use on a daily basis. For example, the awesome data fetching libraries of React Query and SWR. Now, of course, you can use these libraries to make atomic requests to a server, but you can also do some really cool things with them. And that's what I'm gonna show you in this. I'm gonna show you some examples and get you thinking about different ways that you can use these awesome libraries. And be sure to stick around until the end because number five will answer the age old question about whether or not if you have a data fetching library like React Query or SWR, do you still need a state manager? We'll find out. But before we get into that, I did want to give a heartfelt thanks to everyone who has commented in the blog section of the YouTube channel. My wife is in the hospital with acute leukemia. She is getting better, which is great. And I just want to thank you all so much for all of the heartfelt outpouring of good thoughts and prayers. It was just, it's just really wonderful. Now, a lot of you asked if there are things that you can do for me and us, and I think that's great. The best thing you can do is just donate blood and we would really appreciate that. And I'm sure lots of other patients would as well. All right, let's jump right into the code. So in the description down below, you're going to find a link to the GitHub repo that has all of the code that I'm going to show you in here. And there's basically two different versions of the same project. Now, I already have the SWR version already done. What we're going to do together is create the React Query version and then kind of reference the two to show what like small differences there are in the implementation of these two things. But it's pretty cool stuff. So the first thing we need to do is basically set up the React Query version of this. By the way, there's also an article that is associated with this video that's also linked to in the description down below. So let's go with this setup. First, I'm going to do yarn create React app and I'm going to create the RQ version. Okay, it looks like we're all good. Now I'm going to go into that RQ version directory. And within that, I am going to add our UI library, which in this case is Mantine. So I'm going to add Mantine core and Mantine hooks. And I'm also going to add React Query. Okay, looking pretty good. So let's go and drill into our app.js and I'm going to remove a lot of stuff since we don't need it. In fact, I'll remove all of that. And what I'm gonna bring in from Mantine is the container. As well as stack, which is a vertical layout manager. And then also title, which is just like an H2 sort of thing, or H whatever you want. So make a stack. And then within that, I'm gonna put the title of our first example, which is going to be a login example. And I also want to go and set up React Query. So what I'm going to need to do is kind of wrap this in a query client provider. So let's go make that client first. So I'll make a file called client.js and I'm going to import the query client from React Query. This is not something you need to do with SWR. So it is. And then we're going to export the default, which is just a new query client. All right, now I've got our client. So I want to bring that into our app.js. And now down here, we're going to have our wrapped app and that's going to wrap our app in the query client provider. So let's go and bring that in query client provider. And we'll bring that in from React Query. And now down here, we'll have a wrapped app, which is just going to be our wrap app, but wrapped in that query client provider. And I'll export that as the default and let's see, let's give it a try. So we'll do yarn start here and see if we got a, a good working app. Hey, it looks good. Okay. So we've got our login up there and that corresponds to the title right there. So here's what we got. Example number one 
it is a multi-stage request. So let's imagine that you are writing like the auth slash get the user data flow for an application. And the microservices stack that you're talking to, the first thing you need to do is make a request to log in. And that's gonna give you back a user ID. And then with that user ID, you can request again, the user information, like the name, all that. Now, ideally you would get that all in one request, but the microservices folks are like, no, it's microservices. We don't want to do that. So we're, you have to make two requests. So you're like, oh man, okay, fine. So let's go and kind of mock this up by creating some example data over here in public. Now, the first thing I'm going to make is like a, like a login.json and it's going to have the ID that's coming back. The ID, let's say like 2200, 2200. Now we got to go with that ID and go make a subsequent request and get the data for like user 2200. So I'll just have 2200.json and it's gonna have, you know, some data in there, you know. First name is Jack, last name is like Sparrow, arg. Okay, so here's the idea, right? We need to make one fetch. It's gonna get that ID back and then we're gonna make a subsequent fetch. Once that's completed, to go get the 2200 the user data, because that's what we really want to put. We really want to put that on the screen. So, okay, let's go over and create our code for this. So I'll create a new file and call it login.jsx. And the first thing I'm gonna do is create a component. So we're gonna have the login component and we'll just return, at some point we're gonna return some text here and that text is going to have some data. So for the moment, we'll just JSON stringify null into there and we'll bring in that text from Mantine. And then we'll export this as the default. All right, now let's go over to our app and we'll bring this in. So we'll import login from dot slash login and we'll put it under login. Now it should just say null there right now. And it does, cool, awesome. Okay, so now we've got a working page. Now we need to start making our fetches. So the first thing we need to do is bring in use query from React Query. And we're gonna go make that login fetch. So we'll do that. We'll uh, have data is gonna be the login data and we're going to call use query and it's going to have a key of login. And then we need to go fetch that. So I'm going to make a function. We'll call it fetch login and we'll just put it in there and call it. And this is going to be defined up here. Fetch login. Just going to do fetch. We'll just say login.json. And then we will get back the data by getting the response back and getting the JSON out of the response. Okay, cool. And let's uh, let's stringify that in there and see how we go. Okay, cool. We got our ID 2200, right? So this is the thinking right now that I have one fetch and I'm gonna have one hook per my one fetch. So what would I need to do if I wanted to continue on? Well, I would need to go and make the user ID fetch. So I'm gonna have fetch user and it's gonna have an ID. And then we're gonna use string template and we're gonna say that we're gonna put the ID in there. So that's gonna give us our 2200, right? And now we gotta go get that data. So we're gonna say, we'll fetch the user and call this data user, but we need to give it that ID. So where do we get that from? Well, it's gonna be login.id but we don't know if it's there yet. It might, might not be there. So what we should do is use a, a question mark dot to basically say, well, if the login is null, then don't blow up, but we don't even wanna run this until we have that data. So we're gonna use the enabled option on here to basically say, well, only do this if the login ID is not undefined. Cool, right? So hit go and yep, that worked. So we actually got the login and then we use the login to do that fetch. And yeah, this works, but it's kind of a pain. And imagine if you had like three or four of these requests, you know, it's, it's going to kind of stack up. The complexity is going to get out of hand. 
So what's an easier way to do this? Well, an easier way to do this is to do what I, don't, I think a lot of people sort of don't think about when they think about how to use uh, things like React Query and SWR, and that's to actually make a function that is an async function and use that to as your source of your promise that use query or use SWR is going to monitor. So let's do this. Let's go and make a login function. And it's going to be an async function so that we can use await and all that. And what we're going to do is we're going to get our login response by calling await of the fetch login. Clean enough. And then we are going to return and await for the fetch user with the ID that comes back from that login response. Now we can go and replace fetch login down here with login. Get rid of all that. And this is going to be our user data. And Bob's your uncle. So now this login can be as complicated as you want. It can have multiple requests. You can have try catch blocks. You can have all kinds of error handling, all kinds of logic in here, and you can still use use query or use SWR in this context. In fact, the article that goes along with this video, which is pointed to in the description down below, has a bunch of different variants of this. For example, sequential fetching, uh, parallel fetching using promise.all. So some nice examples for you to work off when it comes to handling multiple requests from a single use query. So how does this look like in SWR? That's a great question. Let's go take a look. So the SWR variant is not all that much different. So go back over here to the SWR version and take a look at login.js. And we've got our fetch login, just like before, fetch user, just like before, same exact login function. The only difference in this case is that instead of use query from react query we're using swr and use swr and that's it so really nice actually one of the really nice things about swr in this case is you don't even need a, a client you don't need the query client provider at all the app.js is just the app there's no wrapper or anything like that so you don't need that top level query client provider when it comes to the app.js all right, so the next one we're going to do is a stopwatch example. We're going to turn React Query into a stopwatch. How cool is that? Because I know you're like, hey, wait a second. You said this wasn't this video wasn't about fetching, but you, all you've done is fetching so far. Let's not do any fetching. Let's go and make a stopwatch using React Query. So how do we do that? Well, let's go back over here to our app.js file. And then I'm going to go and add a title for stopwatch. And let's go create our stopwatch example. So I will do stopwatch.jsx and I'm going to go and create a component called stopwatch. And it too will have a piece of text that says the time and then it's going to have some number in there, right? Number of seconds passed when the component mounts. So that's going to give us our stopwatch. And then I'm going to export that as the default. And now I need to bring in that text from man time. And let's go bring it over under our app. And we'll take a look at it. And there you go. So time zero, obviously it's not going anywhere. So how are we going to make a stopwatch? Well, there's two parts to a stopwatch, right? There is knowing your starting point. So knowing when you click that button and got that stopwatch going, and then there's actually looking at it every second to watch it kind of go. So we're going to break this problem into two pieces. The first piece is figuring out when we started and the time elapsed since when we started. So what we're going to do is we are going to create a functor. That's a function that creates functions and we're going to call it create stopwatch. And what it's going to do is it's going to get the starting time by calling date.now, which is just a number. And then it's going to return a function. And every time you call that function, that function is going to give you the time in seconds from between those two things. So between the current time and when it started. So we're going to turn math.round from date time now minus the start time over 1000, because all of this is in milliseconds and we want it to be in seconds. So now we have to 
create our stopwatch in our component. So the way that I'm going to track that is I'm going to use it, use a reference for that. So I'm going to call use ref from react. And we're going to get our timer ref. And that's going to be a use ref where we just call that create stopwatch. So timer ref dot current is our function. And every time we call that function, we get the delta between when it started and now. So how do we do that? Well, let's bring in our good old friend use query from React Query. And we're going to get our data, which is our time. And we're going to use use query and we're going to call that function timer ref current. Now, if you're like, whoa, wait a second, Jack, this is not an asynchronous function. This is a synchronous function. It doesn't matter. It's really cool. It can call either. It actually doesn't care whether it's a synchronous function or an asynchronous function. So let's do that. Let's do time in there and see what happens. So we'll hit start and we get zero. So there's zero delta between the first time that it created that stopwatch function and the first time that you use query actually pulled that function. So what we can do is we can say that we want a refetch interval and we can set it to say, I don't know, hundred milliseconds, go and check every hundred milliseconds to see if there's a new time. Let's hit save. And there you go. We have a stopwatch. How cool is that? Neat, right? All it's doing is it's basically reusing the mechanics that are already built into use query, which you might have thought, hey, that's when we go off and we pull a service over and over and over again. Well, you don't have to just pull a service. In this case, you can pull whatever you want, like a, a stopwatch function. All right. So you want to see how this is done in SWR? Let's go have a look. So I'm going to jump back over here to our SWR version and take a look at the SWR version of our stopwatch. Exactly the same create stopwatch functor, exactly the same stopwatch ref. And then down here with our use SWR, instead of doing refetch interval, we do refresh interval and deduping interval. So two instead of one, but hey, very little difference in the implementation between these two things. OK, but I know you're saying to yourself, I'm not going to go and build a timer with React Query. That's just nuts. And I, I kind of agree, honestly. So I'm going to give us a more practical example and call that our, our second example. And, but it's going to be based on this timer example. So here's the problem. We have a service which is logging data to us. And it is logging data to us at a high velocity. Let's say that messages are incoming at, say, every 100 milliseconds, at 200 milliseconds. But the user, the customer, really doesn't care about this log and they don't want to see it updated that often. Maybe they want to see it updated only every second or every couple of seconds because it's just not that important. They got to see it, but they don't care that much. So how do we go and use something like React Query to do that throttling for us? Well, I'm going to start by creating a file called logger.jsx. And I'm going to export a new component called logger. And logger is going to have like a stack of log messages. So we'll do a stack. And then within that stack, we're going to have some text items. But we'll just keep it at a stack at the moment. And we'll export this as the default. And then we'll bring in stack and text from Mantine Core. And let's get this going. So I'll go over here to the app. And then I'll bring in logger. And I'll add it down here as logger. Cool. Let's take a look. There we go. Logger. So now we need to go and make a, a simulated log. So I'll create a new function called subscribe to log. And it's also going to be a functor and it's going to return a function that when you call it gives you the most recent contents of the log. So we're going to start with an array, which is all the log messages. And then we're going to have an index of the current log message. We'll start at zero. And then we're going to have a set interval. So we're going to have an interval that basically just simulates this incoming log. So I'll say set interval. And it's going to be a function and that's going to get called every 100 milliseconds or so. 
And then every 100 milliseconds, we're going to push in a new message. I'm going to say log.push. And we'll push in a log index and we'll say also the date dot now, right? Just the current time. And we'll bump that log index. But we don't want this kind of overflowing the screen. So I'm just going to limit this down to the last three log messages. So I'll say log dot slice, just take the last three. That's going to basically pull off the last one and just keep the list at like three or so. And then we're going to return a function, which gives us back the log. Current contents of the log. So now we've got our subscriber. Now we need to go actually subscribe to it. So we'll create a log listener that's just going to subscribe to that log. And this is what we're going to pull using React Query. So we'll bring in, again, use Query from React Query. And then we'll have our data, which in this case is going to be the log. And it's going to go against that log listener, right? So what do we do with that log? Well, we need to go map through it. So let's do log.map, and then we'll go and just print it all out there. All right, so let's try it. Let's hit go. And we oh, oh, got an error. Let's go take a look and see what the error is. Oh, there's nothing. OK, there's no data yet. So let's do question mark dot. OK, cool. All right, there you go. Well, it shows some log entry there just for a second. But I think that was like a hot reload sort of thing. So. What's happening right now is it's actually running. But we're not actually doing that refetch interval. So that's this is when we bring in the refetch interval. And this is when we get to actually throttle how fast we want it. So in this case, let's go with 100 milliseconds first and see what happens. So you can see that this is really, really fast moving. It's like, dun, 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 right? Go, 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 go. And the user's like, whoa, I don't want to see this much log. I don't want to see it go that quickly. So I'm going to go and tweak this to say every second. There you go. Now I've got a throttle. How cool is that? That's really nice. I like it. All right, so let's go take a look at the SWR version of this. So go back over to our SWR variant and dig in there. And our SWR variant of logger is exactly the same thing, except that we are using refresh interval as opposed to refetch interval. And we need to put in this deduping interval to make sure that it actually makes the request every time. All right, so what's up next? Well, let's take a look. So what's up next is a GPS example. We are going to use React Query to make a GPS request. How cool is that? From the browser itself. Let's go check it out. So I'm going to go back over here into RQ version, and we'll go bring in a title for GPS. And then I will go create a file called gps.jsx. And the first thing I'm going to do is create a component called GPS, and it's going to return some text that's going to have our coordinates in it. And I'll export that as the default. Of course, I've got to bring in text from the Mantine core. And now before we go, actually, let me bring in a big piece of code here. This is a get GPS coordinates. So what this does is it gives us back a promise. What do we call it? It calls the get current position function, which is kind of an old school callback system that basically gives you your current latitude and longitude. So we're just going to resolve the latitude and longitude. And if we get an error, then we'll reject it with an error. This is basically wrapping this geolocation get current position in a promise. All right, let's go back over to our app and bring in GPS. And we'll put it down here. All right, let's see. Do we have a GPS? Yeah, we do. Cool. Now we need to actually go get the data. So how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to use use query for that from React Query. And we'll say that we have our incoming data. And we'll use use query with a key of GPS and that function to get the GPS coordinates, which is return our promise. Use query is going to manage that promise for us. And once that promise gets resolved, then we have our data. So let's JSON stringify that. And now we have our latitude and longitude. By the way, if you want this to show any arbitrary position, you can actually go over into the inspector and then bring up the sensors by doing shift command P and then sensors. And you do show sensors that goes down here and then you can override that location to anywhere you want, like mountain view, for example. Now, now it's a mountain view. Ta-da! Pretty cool, huh? Okay. So how do we do this over in SWR? Let's give it a try. 
So we'll go over here to our SWR version. And as you can imagine, it's almost exactly the same thing. The only difference is use SWR versus use query. Now, the next one is actually something that I've seen used in applications that I've worked on, and I've worked used this myself. When you want to build an application that's multi-threaded, you use web workers. Now, to talk to a web worker, you have to go and send back and forth messages, and it can be kind of painful. But actually, React Query and SWR make it really easy. Now, we're not going to be able to do this with what I have right now. So what I need to do is I need to go and stop the application. And then I'm going to add in a Webpack extension that's going to allow me to really quickly add web workers to my app. And that extension is called the Workerize Loader. So it's restart now that I've got that going. That looks pretty good. So now let's go and create a web worker. I'm going to go create something really simple. Create a file called worker.js. And in it, we're going to have a, an exported function called multiply numbers. It's going to take two numbers and return the result of multiplying those two numbers together, thus multiply numbers. Obviously, you're going to want to do something more complicated than this, but this is just really for demo sake. So let's go and create a web worker.jsx file. And now I'm going to import that worker using that workerized loader. So now I've got the worker. I need to go and create an instance of that worker. And now I need to create a function and we'll call it multiply numbers. And what multiply numbers does is it adds an event listener to that instance, basically saying, wait, when you get a message back from it, then here's what I want you to do. I want you to resolve the promise with the result that you get back. So this is the result of the post message over here. And it looks to see to make sure that the message coming back is a result. And then it does the worker instance multiply numbers with the incoming arguments. So given an object, that ob object would have A and B in it. And then it would go and run that multiply numbers. Okay, so now we got to go and create our components. We'll call that web worker. And this one, I want kind of two text boxes and then the result kind of laid out horizontally. So for that, I am going to use a group. Group does a horizontal layout and stack does a vertical layout. So I'm going to bring in group from Mantine Core as well as text input, a button, and also text. So we're going to have two text inputs to the two different values, A and B, and then a button to say, do the multiply, and then some text to display the resultant value. All right, so let's go build our text fields first. So I'm going to use use state for that. And down in here, we're going to have our two use states for our value A and value B. Then we're going to have our text inputs for value A and value B that set those values. Now, OK, sounds like a good time to actually go and export the default here and then bring it into our app. So we'll go back over to app.jsx and we will import web worker. And then make a title for web worker and drop it in there. Let's take a look. Okay, cool. So now we've got our two text fields, 10 and 20 down here. Pretty good. Now I want a button and also the piece of text. So now is when we actually start to hook it up to our react query. So we're not really doing a query here. We're kind of doing more in my mind of a mutation. So in this case, I'm going to use use mutation from react query. Because we're essentially doing an action or you know, kind of calling something, calling a function. And so I'm going to categorize that as more of a mutation. So down here, I'm going to say that the data is, let's see, the value, I guess, coming back. And then we're going to get mutate from use mutation which also takes a key first. So we'll call that multiply numbers and then we'll give it that function, multiply numbers. Cool. Okay, so we'll put the value down here in a piece of text. And now we just gotta make that button. So we'll create a button. We'll say that it's multiply. And then in here, on click, 
we're just going to mutate and then we'll give it the two values. So in this case, you know, I'm just going to make it like plus value A and plus value B. Thanks for, thanks GitHub Copilot, but I'm, yeah, it was a bit much. So the plus will automatically will coerce it into a number. Okay, let's give it a try. Let 10, 20, hit multiply and get 200. Awesome. Hit, hit uh, 5,000 here by five and you get 25,000. So isn't this a really nice way to be able to communicate with a web worker, right? So you, all you gotta do is just kind of wrap it in something that promisifies it. And then you can use use mutation to run your web worker. How cool is that? Okay, now there actually is, this one's a bit different when it comes to React Query versus SWR because SWR doesn't have a mutation in it, doesn't have user mutation. So how's that, this work? Well, okay, so the implementation here is slightly different. So you have used SWR and you give it a key, a key is multiply, and then we're gonna give it this odd kind of initial function. So this initial function is just gonna return the initial data for this. We'll just set it to, to zero to start and it's going to hold that result, but it's also gonna give us back this mutate function. Now this mutate function is kind of interesting. What mutate allows you to do is a little bit unexpected. Mutate takes a new value and then just mutates the local cache. And if you don't revalidate, then it actually won't go and re-get data. But if you don't pass revalidate, what you're basically just mutating the local cache temporarily until you get back the result from the server. So what we're doing in this case is we're manually calling multiply numbers ourselves. And then as a promise, we're waiting to see that when that resolves. And then once that resolves, we are then mutating our local value for SWR for that uh, result here. And that's how we use, use, w, use SWR to actually hold the state of the result from this web worker. It's actually kind of almost getting around SWR entirely. Um, in this case, I don't think I'd actually use SWR, but I think there's, you know, still it's interesting to see the different approaches here. The lack of a mutation function in SWR is, is pretty interesting and it's a big difference between React Query and SWR. And it's something that actually starts as a good segue into our fifth and final example, which is super exciting because it asks and answers that age old question of, do you need a state manager if you already have React Query or SWR? And the answer is, well, you probably do in any real world, in any large application, you probably have one already. But in the case of small applications, maybe you don't because you actually can use React Query or SWR as a place to hold global state, which yeah, it's kind of like 80% of what a state manager is doing. I mean, the other part of a state manager is obviously all of the process around changing state. Like if you have X state and you're using a finite state machine or something like that, I mean, there's obviously a lot of rigmarole around that, but I think, you know, holding state as globals is large, a large part of what a state manager does for us. So, so let's go build a React query state manager. All right, we're gonna go over into our app.js and I'm gonna create a new title. We'll call this one global state. And we'll create a new file called global state.jsx. And let's bring in some prereqs. So I'm gonna bring in text and text input and stack, just like we had before from Anton Core. I'm gonna bring in use query and then I'm gonna bring in the query client. And that's actually kind of important in this case. Now we're gonna have three components in here. So we're gonna have the global state component and that's gonna have a stack. And in that stack, we're gonna have two components. The first one is the state editor. And then the next one is the state viewer. All right, now let's export this. Okay, now what does our state editor look like? So we'll have a state editor and it's going to have a text input in it. And so what we'll do is we'll say that the value is a use query and we'll call this shared text. And the function in this case is just going to turn an empty string. So it's going to start off, this is the initial data and this initial data is going to be an empty string. And we're going to say that it is not enabled. 
And so in this case, the text input value is going to be that value. Now the cool thing is the state viewer is basically going to be the exact same thing. So we'll do state viewer. And in this case, it's going to have text. And that text is going to have in there. Okay, so let's go and hook this up to the app and see what this is going to look like. So we'll go over here, we'll go and bring in global state. And then I'll go down here and add it as a component. Let's take a look. So now we've got this text input field down here. And the idea is when I type in here, that it should show up down in here, because these two are going to be essentially linked, they're going to show the same piece of data. So what I need to do is somehow magically teleport this value from the text input to this value down here, it, which is in our state viewer. So I'm going to do that. Okay, so how am I going to do that? Well, what I can do is I can look at the on change. And the on change is going to give us an event. And what I need to do is with the client, I am going to set the query data. Then I give it that key, the shared text key, and then give it the current value. So let's hit refresh and see what happens. All right, looking pretty good. Now, can I type in there? Oh my gosh, wow. So what's actually happening here? So what's actually happening is we're using the cache of the query client, in this case, to hold that piece of data, that shared text value. Now we can actually make this a little bit more generic. For example, we can go and say that we have a use RQ global state hook. And so what does this need to have? Well, it needs to have the key, right? And the initial data. And then with that, it's going to return a, an array. So we're going to model this like use state. It's going to have the first value is going to be the data. And the second value is going to be a setter. We're going to set that data. So let's see, we'll bring in this piece of code right here. So use query. And from that, we're going to get dot data. So that's going to be our data value. And let's see, we can do a little bit better here. We can set that to the initial data. We can set initial data down there. Cool. And then down here for the setter, we'll take the value. And then we'll do the client set query data and then give it the key as well as the new value. Cool, right? Okay, so let's try this out. So we're gonna go and replace this guy. So we'll have value and set value. And we'll say it's gonna be shared text. We'll just start it off with nothing. Get rid of this. Have set value here, replace the set value there with the EVT target value. Nice. Come down here. All you have to do is make sure that we have the same key in both places. We don't need the set value since we're only reading it in this case. And let's try it again. Very cool. Now we have a generic hook that actually uses the cache that you already have if you have React Query to store data. Now, would I do this with real business data? No, probably not. In any large application, you're probably going to already have a global state manager and you don't need to do something like this. But if it's a small application and what you're trying to just share around between components is something, say, like a user ID and a jot, this actually might not be a bad way to go. You've already got it there and either you could use this or use context. But I don't know if you really want to bring in a full state manager for just that. And I think this is actually I don't know, pretty interesting as a way to go. Certainly an interesting option for you. The SWR variant is, I would say, eh, relatively, you know, maybe even a little bit cleaner. So we'll go take a look over there at global state. And this is our use SWR global state hook. So it has exactly that same API surface. It's going to give you back the data and, the, and a setter, just like use state. In this case, we have that initial data. We have that key. We're going to give you either the data or the initial key. And then we're going to use that mutate function like we did in the last example with that revalidate false to set that cache value in SWR and use the SWR cache again as our global state manager of a sort. Pretty cool. All right. Well, I hope this video gets your juices flowing and your mind thinking about all of the things that you can do with React Query and SWR and take advantage of these 
awesome tools. I can't wait to hear what you do with it. Of course, all of the code is available to you in GitHub for free and the link down below, as well as a cool article that goes into more depth on this. In the meantime, of course, if you like this video, hit that like button. And if you really like the video, hit the subscribe button and click on that bell and you'll be notified the next time a new blue collar coder comes out.